In this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. Neither one is a particularly pleasant topic, but taxes are arguably the lesser evil, so let's focus on them. Taxes are an unfortunate reality for most people living and working in the modern world. We pay them every year, we complain about them, and then we try to forget about them until next year. Yet taxes are also one of the most important elements of any economy around the world. Societies can grow from effective taxation and crumble without it. Taxes are what fund our roads and schools and parks, our military, emergency services, social welfare, and everything else in between. These services are structural elements of modern society. We wouldn't have these without taxes, and without them, we would have chaos. So, do we need taxes? Well, not necessarily. They serve an important purpose, sure, but there are other systems that could theoretically achieve the same thing. Any alternatives that exist to one of the most important factors in our economies are worth exploring, even if some of them are a bit out there. You are watching an Economics Explained video made possible by our patrons on Patreon. If you enjoy these videos, please consider liking and subscribing. Before we start trying to prove Ben Franklin wrong, it is important to truly understand what it is that taxes achieve and why we pay them. Taxes are what a government uses to raise revenue to fund its expenditures. If a government does not raise enough taxes to fund these expenditures, it does what anybody else would do. Take on debt temporarily to live above its means. This is the massively oversimplified cycle of government fiscal policy in our modern economies, and it should make sense to everyone. If we stop paying taxes, the government either has to stop paying for services that keep society going, or it takes on more and more debt until it ends up going bankrupt. So this is why taxes are levied. Simple enough. But there is more nuance to this argument. Certain economic schools of thought, not to mention political ideologies, advocate for raising fewer tax dollars and spending less money. Their opposition will argue that raising more tax dollars and spending more money is the way to go. Both of these sides will argue that their way is the right way to deliver the most overall prosperity to an economy. They can't both be right, right? Well, in a sense they can, so remember this for later. In either case, taxes will still exist. So now it's important to ask why do people pay their taxes? Some people have made the argument that taxes are like paying a subscription to modern society. But let's be honest, it's not out of some civic duty to keep your nation going or even because you think you will benefit from government programs. I mean, come on. Let's be honest, the real reason is that if you don't pay your taxes, you go to prison. As far as motivation goes, this is about as much as most people need. So let's look at the alternatives. The United Arab Emirates, Qatar, Monaco, Brunei, these are all examples of national economies that operate without the need for income taxes. In fact, Prior to 1913, the USA did not have federal income taxes. So this gives us an easy answer to the question of do we need taxes? To which these countries would answer a resounding no. But this all comes with one big asterisk, or rather two big asterisks. The first is that these countries do have taxes. They just don't have income taxes. When we explored the economy of Monaco, which is a nation famous for being a tax haven, we found that a majority of the government's revenue still came from taxation. In the case of Monaco, this was a value added tax or a sales tax. This is ideal for these tourist nations because it generates government revenue from people just visiting the country, rather than income taxes which require people to work in the country. Alternative taxes are a common feature for a lot of countries and they have a lot of advantages. Take Singapore for example. It still has income taxes, but they are incredibly low. What it does instead is levy taxes on things that require government expenditure. Cars are the best example here. Roads and highways and traffic lights and bridges and tunnels are all funded by taxes, apart from the few toll roads. These are expensive and not everyone gets the same use out of them. Someone who works from home and walks everywhere in a normal country is still going to have to pay for roads through their income taxes, even if 
they never use them. In Singapore though, they wouldn't really need to. Income taxes are low, but instead, the government raises the money it needs by taxing the bejesus out of people that actually own cars. Depending on the type of car, buying and registering a vehicle in Singapore can easily cost five times as much as it does in the United States. This gives the Singaporean government the revenue it needs to pay for these public goods. If you don't need or want to drive a car, no worries, you don't need to pay. In many ways, this is a really, really fair system. You get what you pay for. Beyond this, it helps ease congestion in this tiny nation because not many people are going to drive given how expensive it is. However, this system is not without its problems. When a car costs as much as a house, many people are not going to be able to afford it. For some people, driving is just a necessity. They might be in an industry that requires driving, they might have disabilities that require easy transport, or they might live in a remote area with no easy access to public transportation. Remember this for later, because it is very, very important. The arguments back and forth for this type of taxation are fascinating. You could make a video about it. And oh look, we did. But Singapore still has taxes, so it might be fascinating, but it's irrelevant. Instead, let's look at that second big asterisk. The other countries that get away without charging taxes have some alternative form of revenue. More often than not, it's natural resources. By substituting tax revenue with oil revenue, these countries can still provide all of the amenities one would expect in a regular old tax paying country. Even places like Alaska do not need to charge state taxes. In fact, they go beyond this and disperse a share of this oil revenue amongst its residents of the state. So you could call this negative taxes? Or social welfare? It depends on your flavour of politics, I suppose. The problem here, of course, is that a country needs natural resources to substitute tax revenue with natural resource revenue. Another big problem is that this kind of is taxation. In theory, the natural resources of most countries belong to the people of that country. Taking away natural resources to sell is no different from taking away cash. In both instances, a government is taking an asset away from the people to pay for public expenditures. Of course, people will feel direct taxation a lot more than natural resource sell-offs, but it is still important to consider for the sake of our question here. So maybe the problem here is the assumption that governments need revenue at all. You have probably asked this question as a kid. Why does the government not just print money to pay for everything it needs? Now, we tend to scoff at this question and just say, cause inflation. Which is not incorrect, but it's not the whole story. In reality, there is not much stopping a government like the US conjuring cash into existence to pay for everything it needs. Logistically, this is what it already does. If Uncle Sam needs to write a check, he does so by snapping his fingers and hey presto, there's some money. If you did this indefinitely, you would eventually introduce more and more and more money into the economy. Cash is an asset like any other. Its value is determined by supply and demand. The only reason this gets confusing is that we normally express the value of an item as a nominal cash value. Outside of this, if you have more money being pumped into the economy, it will cause inflation because the supply rises. Although, it will do it slowly. What a country like this would need is a way to drive up demand for the currency to ensure that it stays in line with this increased supply. The easiest way for a government to ensure that there is a consistent demand for its currency is to force the citizens of the nation to deliver a portion of this currency back to them at the end of every year. As taxes. This whole system of taxation and money creation is called modern monetary theory. Subscribers to this theory will argue that in theory, a government, especially a government like the United States, can just keep on printing money. So long as they can find a way to ensure that people still demand the currency, they can create this money to pay for your roads, schools, and whatever else you want. Actually maintaining that demand without taxation is the hard part. And of course, if not done properly, you are going to get hyperinflation. Hyperinflation is straight up not a good time. So eventually this type of system is bound to become unstable. Hopefully, 
that isn't a huge surprise to too many people. Okay, so this is all not looking so great for our do we need taxes question. But so far we have held on to the assumption that we actually need government expenditure. Or for that matter, governments at all. What would happen if we let go of all of these assumptions? Anarcho-capitalism is an economic theory that advocates for the complete elimination of government influence in an economy. In such a system, everything is privately owned. There are no public roads, schools, parks or hospitals. There aren't even things like social welfare or emergency services. The idea of such a system is that private enterprise would replace these publicly provided goods and the profit motive would encourage these services to become more competitive and therefore deliver a greater net value to society. Sounds kind of good, right? Well, the first thing it does is eliminate taxes. If there are no governments, there are no governments to raise taxes. So, mission accomplished, I guess. Beyond this, it must be recognised that there are some legitimate advantages to such a system. An individual would only ever have to pay for something that they actually wanted or needed, and they could be relatively confident that they could be getting a good price for their purchase so long as there is still competition in this market. There are actually examples of society like this scattered throughout history, the most prominent of which were medieval European free cities. These were places operated by merchants and were ultimately run purely for the profits of the individuals making them up. The whole idea of purely unrestrained capitalism has some really interesting thought experiments. The first is that of disabilities. In a purely capitalistic society, someone who is born with or develops a disability is going to be less productive and therefore less economically valuable as an individual. It sounds horrible, but it's true. In extreme cases, they may not be able to make enough money to feed or clothe themselves, so they would just die. A huge assumptive leap here is that even the most hardcore free market economists would see this as a negative outcome. So what are the alternatives? Well, insurance. Social security is kind of like the price we pay to ensure that if we lose our job or get sick or injured, that we won't starve. An insurance company could provide this same service. You could insure yourself against getting injured or developing an illness or even having a child that requires constant care. What's more, is that you could tailor this cover. If you are an incredibly wealthy person and you lose your job today, you are just not going to be able to support your lifestyle on social security checks. So even though you contributed more in taxes throughout your good years, you are going to be the same as everyone else in your bad years. In our hypothetical anarcho-capitalist society, this kind of person would likely pay a higher insurance premium, but in return, if they lost their job, they could have elected for a policy that provides them with a higher payout figure. Beyond that, if you are happy to take the risk, you could just not pay the premiums and save the extra money, or really hope that you don't find yourself out of work. The same kind of private sector switcheroo can be done with almost anything that a modern government provides. This is similar in many ways to the specific expense allocation we saw in Singapore earlier, just dialed all the way up to the extreme. Private everything. Toll roads, private schools, private hospital, everything is for sale. This all starts to run into some problems though with indiscriminate goods. This is a street lamp. They cost about $2,000 on average to erect and they consume about $100 per year in electricity to keep going. Beyond that there are maintenance costs and a few other incidental expenses. All in, they are not a cheap item. Chances are most of us take street lamps completely for granted but they do serve a really important purpose. They illuminate otherwise dark streets providing safety to cars and pedestrians navigating the area at night. But it would be really hard to provide a street lamp in a purely profit driven society. You can't really stop someone from basking in the light of a street lamp. And because of that, it's hard to charge someone money to provide this service. Why would I pay for something if you can't stop me taking it for free? Because there is no profit motive, there is no product, which means that this society may have to go without the service that provides a direct, tangible benefit. The same thing is true on a larger scale with things like emergency services and military protection. A private military may be employed to protect the assets of an individual in an area, 
but in doing so, they are indirectly protecting the assets of everybody else in that area. Therefore, by the same logic, nobody would want to foot the bill to pay for it, and it would not be provided. This gets even worse when you consider the other type of indiscriminate good, the bad type. Just the same as there is no way to prevent an individual basking in the light of a street lamp, there is no way for an individual to prevent themselves being impacted by negative externalities. In this type of society, people are driven by profits exclusively. Many profit generating industries produce a lot of pollution. In a world like ours, with regulatory bodies, there is some level of control around this. We limit where factories and power stations can be set up and also control what kind of pollution they can leak out into the environment. If these regulatory bodies didn't exist, well then it would potentially be down to private militaries to regulate and enforce these types of externalities. Very quickly you arrive at an outcome where rich people just declare war on things to get their way, which is a real dicey reality to be living in. A solution to all of this is to set up communities that address the problems of these indiscriminate goods. It's hypothetically possible that a company could establish an area where people could live separately from negative externalities and be provided with things like street lamps. Residents of this city would have to pay a subscription, but they get the benefit of having a lot of this stuff sorted out by default. This is also a way to ensure that everyone is chipping in for a military which would keep this area safe and secure, and in the event that someone didn't pay their subscription, they would also be responsible for forcibly removing them from the area. But if you haven't realised by now, this company is basically just a government with taxes with more steps. Anarcho-capitalism is an amazing theory to explore, but most of the time you manage to work your way back to the status quo. The truth is that most products and services are best delivered by corporations with a profit motive, the same way that there are products and services best delivered by governments simply looking to retain power. The exact place to draw the line between businesses and government services is the real debate, but it almost certainly does not lie at either extreme of the scale. This is one of those things that I'm expecting some pushback on. There are passionate advocates for a totally free market. So I put it on you. How would you structure the economy of a perfect society? The best answer will get featured in the next video on this subject. And if the answer is really fantastic, we will explore this hypothetical country just like one of our normal country videos over on our second channel. So leave your comments in the comments section below guys. Nobody enjoys paying taxes, and that's not because it's money out of your wallet. A lot of people really enjoy spending money. People don't enjoy paying taxes because it's money out of their pockets going towards something they wouldn't have otherwise spent their money on. Tax dollars often aren't going to directly improve the quality of life of the people paying them, but they do materially improve society. So long as it is agreed that there are items that would not be provided by private businesses in a competitive market, and that those items do have value, we will need a collective organisation to supply those goods. The most prominent collective organisations we have in the world are governments. And the best tool these governments have available to them to raise revenue is taxes. There are alternatives, but they have their limitations. Do we need to tax as much as we do? Well, no, maybe not. Are there better taxes to levy in smarter ways? Almost definitely. But do we need taxes? Well, they are the worst possible solution apart from all of the alternatives. Hi guys, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing. This video and every other video on the channel are made possible by our amazing patrons over on Patreon. So a huge thank you to the team over there. Make sure to tune in to our Do We Need Taxes Q&A session over on the second channel for what I'm sure will be a very heated debate on a very interesting subject. 